Happy King Day, everybody. Happy King Day, Mayor. It's great to be with you in this fantastic place. And even though I'm a Whetstone Brave, I feel like an East Tiger tonight. I heard some stories from Herschel Craig and Nick Bankston and Kevin Boyce. So uh, there's some old story swapping going on in this great place. But uh, thank you all for being here uh, and excited about uh, marching together with you to celebrate the extraordinary life and legacy of the greatest peacemaker uh, the world has ever known. Uh, great tribute to justice and fairness and inclusion that still guides our work today. Because we're not there yet, are we? No. We're not there yet, are we? No. But together, we will continue to move forward. Gentlemen, please give it up again for the East High School drum line and drill team under the direction of Miss Woods. And now, all you East High School Tiger fans, beware. We have a bulldog in the building. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Columbus's own Miss Angela Pace, Mistress of Ceremonies. So I know there got to be a couple of bulldogs out there. There you go. All right, I have to warn you, though, I'm going to be moving kind of slow because I threw my hip out trying to march to the drum line back there. I used to be able to do that, but that was several drum lines ago. So how about another round of applause? That was fantastic for the East High drum line. We want to thank all of you so much for joining us this evening on this very important day, very special day, because this is the day that we celebrate the dreamer, the drum major of peace, the one, the only, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I am honored to be here along with some of my favorite people, Mayor Genther, Councilman Hardin, Council President Zach Klein, and our very special guest, Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie. <laughs> Dr. King said, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. So, 
With that thought, it is only fitting that we hold this event in a seat of education, a building that fosters learning and the pursuit of knowledge. Columbus East High School, the crown jewel of the East Side. Not only an athletic powerhouse back in the day, and I don't know how y'all doing this year. Y'all doing okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> But back in the day, y'all were bad. People were scared to play y'all anywhere. But it's also an institution that has turned out fine minds and fine citizens. So I'm talking about people like award-winning author Will Haygood, <laughs> statesman I. Ray Miller, who was in the drum line at East High School 100 years ago, and actors Bernie Casey and Hal Williams, just to name a few. Now, on a personal note, even though everybody knows I'm a very, very proud product of Columbus South High School, very proud bulldog, I am very proud to say that both my parents, my mama and my daddy, were East High Tigers. Both of them were. They both attended East. I don't think my father graduated, though. I'm not sure. I have to check that. I know my mother did. I got to check on daddy. I'm not sure. But this is where they met. This is where they fell in love. So I still feel a very, very strong connection to East High School. I'm very honored to be up on this stage helping to celebrate Dr. King's legacy. We have a very full program for you, so to kick us off musically, please welcome the Pentecost Arise Choir. Hello, everyone. Hello. So our song says, because we live, we can face tomorrow. So we just want to encourage you all here that there is hope for the future. Amen. Amen. Amen.
ladies and gentlemen, our invocation will be delivered by the very busy spiritual leader of Holy Rosary St. John and St. Dominic, Father Joshua Wagner. Good evening, Columbus. How are we? Good. All right. You know, I, uh, as uh, Miss Pace just uh, told all of you, I'm the pastor of two fantastic communities here on the east side of Columbus, Holy Rosary St. John and St. Dominic, and I get to serve uh, the folks in my parish, and I'm just so pleased to be here in Columbus. We have a fantastic city. Don't we have a great place that we live in? And I know we're not perfect here, and I know that sometimes we have our victories and sometimes we have our trials. But I do think, I do think in this fantastic city that we live in, we try to implement the best we can the vision of the man we celebrate today, Dr. Martin Luther King. And so in that spirit, I would like to read a very powerful passage of scripture that no doubt also influenced Dr. King. From the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. Let us take a moment and collect ourselves as we hear the words of Scripture. Then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice call from the throne, Look here, God lives among human beings. He will make his home among them. They will be his people, and he will be their God. God with them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death and no more mourning or sadness or pain. The world of the past is gone. Then I saw the one sitting on the throne who spoke, Look, I am making the whole creation new. Write this, what I am saying is trustworthy and will come true. Then he said to me, It has already happened. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give water from the well of life free to anyone who is thirsty. Anyone who proves victorious will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. In the spirit, he carried me to the top of a very high mountain and showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming out of heaven from God. It had all the glory of God and glittered like some precious jewel of crystal clear diamond. Its walls were a great height, and it had twelve gates, At each of the twelve gates was an angel, and over the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Heavenly Father, you endowed Dr. Martin Luther King with a panoramic vision from the mountaintop, a vision of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth where all could live in peace and in harmony with each other. A new heaven and a new earth where the dignity of every man and the dignity of every woman was profoundly understood. Not because of where they had come from or what they have done or what they have failed to do, but because they, Heavenly Father, were made in your image and your likeness and endowed with your dignity. May we, your sons and daughters, understand this profound dignity and treat every person we meet as we would treat you. And may we enter the promised land, the promised land that Dr. King saw, as we build a new heaven and a new earth, beginning here and beginning now, that we may all enjoy the freedom endowed upon you, our Creator endowed upon us by you, our Creator. We ask this in the name of of you, our Heavenly Father, and of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And the people said, Amen.
God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the Friends of the Community Relations Commission, Mary Howard. Good evening, everyone, and happy Dr. Martin Luther King Day to you. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you on behalf of the Community Relations Commission and the Friends of the CRC. I came across a document that I was reading written by Dr. Martin Luther King's wife, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, and she remarked about the meaning of the King holiday. She went on to say that the King holiday honors the life and contributions of America's greatest champion of racial justice and equality. The leader who not only dreamed of a colorblind society, but who also led a movement that achieved historic reforms. She also said that on this day, we commemorate Dr. King's great dream of a vibrant, multicultural nation united in justice, peace, and reconciliation. A nation that has a place at the table for children of every race and room at the end for every needy child. We are called on this holiday not merely to honor, but to celebrate the values of equality, tolerance, interracial sister and brotherhood he so compellingly expressed in his great dream for America. For me, those dreams became a reality as a student in Columbus Public High School at Mohawk High School, so not only are there Bulldogs in East High School, but for those who may remember Mohawk Junior Senior High School, there's an Indian standing right here, and I don't know <laughs> if there are any others in the house. But that dream came true for me when I grew up in a neighborhood and as a product of Columbus Public Schools that it wasn't always expected that we would excel in academic excellence. My dream came true when I was admitted to Capital University to study nursing. My dream came true when I achieved my master's and doctorate degree from The Ohio State University. My dream came true when I had the honor and privilege to serve as the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Nursing Officer at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center across the street at University Hospital East. And so when I think about Dr. King's dream, so not only am I passionate about delivering quality health care to make a, lot, a difference in the lives of others and those patients that we serve, I also have a passion to make a difference in the community where we live. And that is what the Community Relations Commission is all about. The commission was formed in 1990. It was established to help bring civic leaders, business leaders, citizens, and elected officials together on issues of ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity. And I am so proud to live in a community where we also embrace Dr. King's dream. The commission is established also to recommend ways and means of initiating and improving government programs designed to eliminate discrimination or to remove the effects of past discrimination. We are committed to opening the doors of neighborhoods of Columbus for every family. Through the work of the community, the Relations Commission, Community Commission, our vision is to build a community for all so it can be a reality. And so, like Dr. King, we are aligned with his vision to create that and break down those barriers for people within our community. And I'm so proud to have had the opportunity for over 10 years to serve on the Community Relations Commission and also on the Friends of CRC. And I wonder if there are any fellow commissioners out there, if you just give a hand wave, please. All right, thank you.
And I would also uh, like to offer a special thanks to the Friends of CRC for sponsoring the reception that will be held following their program. And so thank you again for being here tonight and enjoy the program. To the ones who are troubled by what's happening in our country, to the ones who see the growing divide between the incredibly rich and those who work hard and still struggle, between the ones who hate everyone not like them and those of us who value diversity, equality, and the unity that comes from respecting the humanity of all people, to you and me, Stay focused. Focus on your personal dreams. Whether you want to graduate from college or join the military or find a job that allows you to take care of your family or become the first woman president of our country, focus. It is hard when we don't know if our sons and daughters will make it home at the end of the day. None of us want our loved ones to become the next hashtag. We see story after story of the most heinous crimes. A man getting caught in the act of rape. Or a video of one person murdering another. Yet we know that justice is not served in all cases entering the judicial system. Still, we must focus, even when everything in us wants to scream from the rooftops to the street corners, from the pulpits to the classrooms, scream because we can't take it anymore. Focus. We need the drive of the ones who came before us. Harriet Tubman, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, Daisy Bates, Shirley Chisholm. They stared in the face of misogyny and white supremacy while being unwavering in their missions. Anger and frustration did not sway them. Focus. Let's look to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all who walked with him, who sat with him, who were arrested and jailed with him. Set the dogs loose. Turn on the water hoses. Place liberty behind the barricade of poverty. Still, it will not stop good people from doing what is right. At the moment, it seems like the current of the river progress has slowed to a trickle. There are those who want to regress into bigotry as they dine on xenophobia and self-aggrandizement. We must focus. While sitting in a Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote of the bottomless vitality of our ancestors. He said, if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. That means we must focus on helping America live up to what she is on paper. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is due everyone. Focus on our faith. I believe that I can do all things through Christ, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You, focus on your faith too. And good people, we must focus on moving forward, no matter what the next few years bring. was built on a fight for acceptance and a fight for peace. 
Martin Luther King Jr., a great symbol of peace, stood on the steps of the courthouse in 1963 and gave a speech that resonated unity, resonated strength. He spoke for individuals everywhere, fighting for a voice, fighting for the liberty that has become this great nation's trademark. Now, for a majority of my life, I have lived in Johannesburg, South Africa. I had prayed every night that I'd be able to come here. I had wished on every shooting star that I'd be able to come and experience the freedom that America was known for. But knowing the history of South Africa, you may know that the freedom experienced here was just a dream you held on to back home. For most, the reality was facing great amounts of segregation and discrimination, whether it be through stories told by family members or firsthand experiences. All people of color had felt some form of segregation and discrimination. Now my family and I are fortunate to have moved from there and be living here freely and truly blessed in America among you all. But even though we were able to move from a wounded land, our history still follows us just as it does the people of America. America was viewed so highly because of those who found the courage to speak up against what they didn't believe in and spoke up against what they didn't, and they spoke up for what they did believe in. America is viewed so highly because of those who found the courage to fight. Because of those like Martin Luther King Jr. who were able to inspire many to join a fight. Now oppressions, oppressions that Martin Luther King Jr. have fought against have been overlooked as we continue to hear of the violence taking place on our streets. As we continue to hear of every shooting that we have witnessed on the news. Of we, as we continue to hear of every life lost, whether it be a brother or a neighbor or a friend, as we continue to hear of one of ours that have died at the hand of violence. Now, as we have entered a new chapter in our history, we are reminded of everyone that had passed. We're reminded of all of those who have passed by useless violence. We are reminded of those who are now standing as symbols for rallies and protests. We have watched Black Lives Matter campaigns grow and spread, and the only true reason for this would be out of fear. The people are afraid of what their lives could become if they continue to turn their heads away from the targets that seem to be luring over them. If they continue to turn their heads away from the gun that is picking its next victim randomly if they continue to turn their heads away from the issues at hand. We are now at a time where our history means more than we fully understand. We are all called to unite, just as Martin had done with his supporters in Washington, D.C. not too long ago. We are called to take up the lesson that he has taught us. He taught us that unity is power, but peaceful unity is strength. He taught us that we have to come together if we want to move forward. He taught us that all the useless violence that is taking place on our streets are just that, useless. That every bullet shot that has hit one of the people in America is like hitting ourselves. Because we cannot move forward until we are all united and moving forward together. That is why I feel events such as these, events where we can all come together and commemorate where we came from are so important. Events where we can come and take a look at where we came from, as we take a look of every fight that people have taken for us, just so we can all sit here freely in America. Events in our past of people that have fought, of lives that have passed, just so we could live in the life that we have today. That is why I feel that events such as these, where we can come and see where we came from, are so important. So as we continue to walk forward, as the nation continues to progress, we know what to look for. We know what, what mistakes to look for as we continue to walk forward. So the violence that has taken place, the violence that Martin had fought so hard to prevent in our day and age, are useless. Now, as we are here to commemorate Martin Luther King Jr., I remember reading somewhere that he had said 
the time is always right to do what is right. He had told us that the time is always right to do what is right. There is no perfect time to wait for to make a change because the time is always right to do what is right. The time is always right for you and right for me, for us, to make a difference as a unit. So in thanks to all that fought for us, we are gathered here today. But in true honor of Martin Luther King Jr., we unite. Thank you. Nana Eshon. All right, tell everybody your name. You just walked out here and just acted like you were in charge. You didn't, <laughs> didn't introduce yourself or nothing. What's your name? Nana Eshin. And where do you go to school? I am at Eastmore Academy High School. Yeah. There's some warriors in the house. <laughs> and where are you going to go to school? I am hopefully going to Harvard University. All right, Harvard. I don't know about you, but I have absolutely no doubt <laughs> that she's going to Harvard. <laughs> you know, lots of times when I was still in the news business, I worried about our young people. You have just set my soul at ease. You have just set my soul at ease. And I know, because I'm going to be working for the rest of my life until I find my rich husband. <laughs> I know one day I'll probably be working for you. Nana Eshen. Wow, I love young people. You know, Dr. King never allowed himself to relax or to really get comfortable. He said the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Columbus is so lucky to have men and women in local government who are not afraid to make things uncomfortable when they have to, who rise up in times of challenge and controversy. One such leader is a young man that I've had the pleasure of knowing for a long time. I have watched him work with some of our city fathers and mothers, always respectful, always eager to learn what he can do to make Columbus a better place to live. For everybody, not just a chosen few. He's one of those young folks that I know is going to be a rock star. He is already a baby rock star, but he's going to be a serious, serious rock star. A leader, not just because he wants to, but because he knows he has to. And that makes all the difference. You know you're starting to get up there in age when elected officials start calling you Miss Angela. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of my babies, Columbus Council Member Shannon Harden. <laughs> Good evening, Columbus. It is so, so nice to be here this evening and to be a part of this amazing uh, City of Columbus celebration of the Dr. Martin Luther King Day. Um, I said this the other day um, when I spoke somewhere and I had to follow our Congresswoman, uh, Joyce Beatty. You know, I don't know who I have made upset in this city that today I have to follow Ms. Nana, uh, who gave that awesome, awesome uh, oratorical uh, salute. I join uh, Ms. Angela uh, in saying that the future of our city is bright when we have leaders, young leaders like you, and we are all behind you as you head off to Harvard University. Would you uh, join me? I, I have, uh, like I said, I was, we've been out and about this weekend as we celebrate this important holiday. Um, and it just hasn't been this weekend where I've seen um, this leader uh, perform, um, stand up for us, uh, sit down for us uh, in the wells of the uh, House of Representatives. Would you help me rec recognize our Congresswoman, someone who is taking the fight for us and speaking for us in Washington, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty.
And, and Miss Angela is correct. We do have a, an awesome uh, group of local elected officials who are fighting right here on the ground, working with uh, faith leaders, community leaders, to continue to move our communities forward. Would all the elected officials please stand and be recognized? On behalf of my uh, colleagues on Columbus City Council, on behalf of Council President Zach Klein, we welcome you to the historic East High School. Certainly want to thank uh, Director Carla Williams Scott and the Department of Neighborhoods for hosting this celebration. <laughs> Director told me uh, as we lined up for the march that she also ordered this weather. How about that march? That was awesome. Uh, and we certainly, certainly, certainly want to welcome uh, the Bishop McKenzie to our great city. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to hear from you in just a few mo moments. The people of Columbus, we share a basic set of values. We believe that regardless of skin color, religion, creed, family history, gender orientation, or income bracket, Everyone has the right to live in a safe neighborhood, put in a hard day's work, and come home to spend quality time with their loved ones. These are our values. The principles that rest on a foundation of kindness and respect for our families, for our neighborhoods, and for our communities. But if we are honest with ourselves, it's much easier for us to speak our values than to live our values. We uh, have heard over this weekend um, a lot of great speeches, a lot of uh, remarks that have lifted us up, who have encouraged us to move forward. But our call to action today is to put those words, put this feeling that we have, that we've been encouraged over this weekend, to put it into action tomorrow, to put it into action next week, to put it into action next month, if we do that, Columbus, we will be the better for it. It is truly difficult to, more difficult to live our values and just speak them. But that is why I give thanks for having the leadership of Mayor Andrew Ginther. Mayor Ginther has not just lauded the prospering zip codes of Columbus, he has rolled up our sleeve, his sleeves and to better all of our city. It is easy to talk about diversity and inclusion, but Mayor Ginther went further than just talking about it and created the first ever Office of Diversity and Inclusion. That, yes, that is all. It is easy to talk about equal pay for equal work, but Mayor Ginther has assembled a cabinet with more women directors than any mayor before him in Columbus history. He is. He has also created the Women's Commission to address gender-based economic inequalities. That certainly needs to be recognized. It is easy to talk about how neighbors are, neighborhoods are the backbone of our city, but Mayor Ginther has gone further and created the first ever Department of Neighborhoods. Mayor Ginther, over and over again, has stated his values and then went about implementing them. Would you please help me in welcoming my friend, our leader, the mayor of the best city on earth, Mayor Andrew J. Ginther. What a kind introduction, Councilmember Hardin. Thank you so much. Happy King Day, everybody. Great evening to be with you and so excited to have a national powerhouse, the trailblazer, someone who's seen and busted a few glass ceilings in her day. And I'm not just talking about the best congresswoman in America in Joyce Beatty. I'm talking about the amazing and wonderful Bishop Vashti Murphy Mackenzie, who's joined us here tonight. I will 
introduce her properly here in the next minute or two. But I want to take a moment, if you don't mind. This uh, week, as we celebrate one of the greatest peacemakers on earth, I think it's appropriate to recognize and say thank you to a man who stood on Dr. King's shoulders, a man who over the last eight years has helped to transform America. So it's appropriate, I think, and I'm going to do it as much as I can over the next four days, is to thank Barack Obama. See, friends, I don't think there's been an American president, Democrat or Republican, who has ever done more for the city of Columbus and the people of Columbus than Barack Obama. And I don't just say that. I've brought facts to back it up. The president and the federal government, under his direction and guidance and the amazing work of Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, awarded the Near East Side a 30 million dollar choice neighborhood grant that's helping to lift up and invest in the Near East Side of Columbus. Thank you, Mr. President. This president has helped us grow the largest children's hospital in all of America and brought critical infrastructure dollars to invest in Parsons and Livingston Avenue corridors. Thank you, Mr. President. And along with my dear friend, our senior senator, Sherrod Brown, this president helped bring to the OSU Medical Center the largest construction grant in America's history, $100 million that's helped us create thousands of jobs in this community. Thank you, Mr. President. And through Tiger Grants, he's helped us unleash the economic juggernaut that is Rickenbacker. Over $20 million to help us create thousands of jobs and become a logistical player in the world. Thank you, Mr. President. And under this president and his outstanding transportation secretary, the former mayor, I might add, Mr. Fox, former mayor of Charlotte, helped deliver to this community $40 million to help us leverage what is now up to $600 million to connect the disconnected and help open up ladders of opportunity and mobility to neighborhoods throughout our great city. We beat out 77 cities in America to win the Smart City Challenge. Thank you, Mr. President. And most importantly, brothers and sisters, there are 97,397 of our neighbors that have insurance today that did not have it eight years ago. Thank you, Mr. President. I know many of us are concerned about the change in administrations. There is a new person who will be occupying the Oval Office come Friday. Some of us are scared. All of us are worried. But the truth is, who is in the White House does not change who we are as individuals in this community. Columbus and all of its neighborhoods all the places we call home, will remain the smart, vibrant, open, and accepting places they are today. So a little girl born in South Africa can enter the halls of Harvard. That's, 
the Columbus we know and love. We have that power. You and I. Us. I have a parable I carry with me told by my Cherokee ancestors. And it says a lot about where we are. Story goes, an old Cherokee told his grandson, grandson, there's a battle between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, lies, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. The little boy thought about it and asked, well, grandfather, which wolf wins? The old man quietly replied, the one you feed. The one you feed. <laughs> Dr. King chose to feed good justice, fairness, inclusion, building and supporting a future big enough for all of us to succeed. And look at what he started. Columbus is in pursuit of becoming the beloved community Dr. King taught us about. We know we're not there. We have a long way to go. But the values of this community are going to be what sets us apart and provides that shining example for cities across this country about what being smart and open and inclusive means. The, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice probably seems very long today, but our job as friends and neighbors and loved ones is to keep bending it towards justice, not just on King Day, but every day of the year. Are there any deltas in the house? I thought there might be. Well, I've got one of the, the, the best and baddest Delta in all of America to introduce you to tonight. And I thank God that Congresswoman Joyce Beatty helped bring this amazing leader to us this evening. She's a dear friend. Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie serves as the 117th elected and consecrated bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Her historic election, sounds like a pattern. Her historic election in the year 2000 represents the first time in the over 200 year history of the AME Church a woman had obtained the level of Episcopal office. The first continuous, she served as the president of the Council of Bishops, chair of the General Conference Commission, she was the host bishop for the 49th session of the General Conference, the AME Church in June 2012, with more than 30,000 in attendance. Currently, she is honored to serve as the presiding prelate of the 10th Episcopal District, which is the entire state of Texas. Bishop McKenzie serves as the chairwoman of the Board of Trustees of Paul Quinn College. She is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Bishop McKenzie was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve on the inaugural President's Advisory Council of the White House Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. She recently was invited to preach at the annual White House Easter Prayer Breakfast at the invitation of the President. I'm not sure when she sleeps, but she's also written five books. Bishop McKenzie, well known as an electrifying preacher, 
has been honored for her leadership, community service, and outstanding achievements by a number of diverse civic, educational, business, and governmental organizations and leaders. She was named this year by Huffington Post as one of the 50 most powerful women religious leaders in the world. And she's been honored to be the past national chaplain of those 104 years serving sisterhood, sisterhood scholarship and service of the Deltas. Please give a warm Columbus welcome to Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie. Good evening, Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, Mayor Ginter, for extending the invitation uh, to share uh, in the celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King to my sorrow and friend, Congresswoman Beattie, uh, to the president of the council, uh, to the other council members who are present and those of you who have been elected to serve, to my partner in life and ministry supervisor, Stan McKenzie, won't you stand? <laughs> to all of my sisters in public service, oop, hey y'all. <laughs> to uh, my AME family who is in the room, And greetings to your bishop, uh, Bishop McKinley Young, who is in Cleveland tonight. And I bring you greetings from the great state of Texas. Ohio has been good to me because 17 years ago, I was elected to the Episcopacy in Cincinnati, Ohio. Ah, oh, yeah. And it has been a joy from time to time to come and share with you and a variety of venues. To all of the marchers, all of you, my brothers and sisters who have participated all day long in events, this is an important season of our lives where we need to stop for a moment and remember someone who has done so much. Were you there when our forebears began to hammer the chains of ignorance and uncivil discord, hate and hopelessness, racism and sexism, upon the anvil of pride and arrogance across an America, refusing to embark upon a new egalitarian relationship with all Americans, black and brown, white and yellow and red, striped, polka dotted, purple, blue, whatever the color may be? Were you there when the brave dreams of freedom and justice were born in the hearts of those suffering, the dreams they were willing to live and die for, the battles that they valiantly fought, won, and lost? Were you there in the heat of the day, in the grit and the grind, and the unjust praxis of unjust attitudes, in our nation that promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with her fingers crossed behind her back? Were you there when the crucial juxture in the civil rights movement came on a bloody Sunday afternoon on the Edmund Pettus Bridge between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama, were you there when the 1964 Civil Rights Act legally desegregated the South, yet in too many places it was still too dangerous to be a black man or a black woman? Were you there when you could have been hung from a tree, dragged behind a truck, set on fire, beaten, tortured, or mutilated because you just wanted to register to vote? For most of us in this room, we were not there. And the experience of those who were is too often relegated to a paragraph, a sentence, a footnote in a history book. The deeply moving movie Selma is a powerful reminder of a time when just registering to vote could result in a serious threat to our lives, 
and the lives of our family. It reminds us of all the stubborn persistence of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and legacy we celebrate today. It reminds us, as we graphically hear the thud of every nightstick against human flesh, of peaceful protesters, not zealous celebrants of winning a Super Bowl or a sporting championship or rioters, in a nonviolent action designed to lift the who is my neighbor concern beyond one's race and tribe and gender and class and nation. It was a call for an unconditional love for all humankind. Dr. King said in a speech made at Riverside Church in New York City, I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door, which leads to an ultimately a new reality. King went on to say that we cannot afford to worship the God of hate or bow down before the altar of retaliation. The oceans of history are made turbulent by the ever rising tides of hate. History is cluttered with the wreckage of nations and individuals that pursue this self-defeating path of hate. He said, we are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding canoodrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Are we too late? The echoes from the past, the fierce urgency of now, has found a resting place in this 21st century of ours. Are we too late? Yesterday has become today. Yesterday it was a lynching tree. Today there is media lynching. Yesterday it was marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And today is walking home from a store in a hoodie at night. Yesterday there was the tyranny of separate but equal and today, there's limiting federal court powers to monitor school desegregation and banning claims of institutional discrimination. Yesterday, there was overt racism. Today, there is overt racism. <laughs> Yesterday, there were implicit biases, and today, there is racial profiling, unfair sentencing practices, the privatization of incarceration. Yesterday, there was separate but equal education. And today, there are troubled public school system and the public school to prison pipeline. Yesterday, there was affirmative action. And today, affirmative action programs are being evaluated. Yesterday, there was police brutality on a bloody Sunday afternoon. And today, there is excessive force. We now stand in the wake of the deaths of unarmed black men, women, teens, and children in too many places in America, in Ferguson, in New York, and Baltimore, and Chicago, you name it. The harsh threats that were meted out 50 years ago in Selma reminds us there is still much to be done. We find ourselves in an uneasy position. These events have shaken America out of her fantasy land of a post-racial society. It has exposed the underbelly of hatred and fear and implicit bias that still exists today. We must find a nonviolent way to give voice to the rage simmering just below the surface in all of our communities. And at the same time, remind ourselves and the huddled masses yearning to breathe free that it is not an attack on our government, it is not an attack on police, it is an attack on an unjust system. We must understand that poor education and no education in an information economy is a sentence to a life without the adequate resources and support or power to provide for yourself and your families and those you care about. 
It means you are left out and left behind before you've begun and possibly doomed to low wages or no wages for the rest of your life. Do we yet realize that some opportunity, meager opportunity, or no opportunity for all Americans, regardless of race, gender, or class, means that educated, trained, talented, smart, creative people in science and technological economy will be left out and will be left behind. At the same time, at the same time every year, we remember the man, the movement, and his message. Every time, this year, same time, we begin to dream that dream again. But when will that dream come true? Will it come true in our lifetime? Or will we have to wait another generation? We wonder once more, we hesitantly believe, to lift our eyes to see if the promises of faith and equality will be kept, or is the hokey pokey what it's all about? Can I go to the handheld mic now, y'all? Come on, let's roll back the stone from the door of the tomb, oh God. Set free the good intentions, the gallant aspirations, and the noble commitment long held hostage by fear and self-seeking ambitious. Raise us from the dead, the lives that you gave us for living, and help us to live them with faith born anew and hope undying. We long for a season of possibilities and promise of a hope yet unseen, a, seen, a season of expectation and longing and anticipation, not for just something new, but better. All of us want a better life. All of us want a better tomorrow. All of us want to live better. The question is, how many of us are willing to work for a better tomorrow? A better tomorrow is knocking on the doors of our cynical hearts, invading personalities jaded by the challenges of uncertain times, pricking the consciousness of a culture tossed and twisted by the failure of ethics and the triumph of greed. We find ourselves trapped in a paradox of the and, that is an A-N-D. We are a nation of hope and we are a nation at war among ourselves. We are a land of the free and home of the brave, and we are terrorized by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Ebolism, and extremism, and alternativism. We are a United States, and we are so divided on too many issues. Yes, there is sickness in the land, but there's also hope and healing. There's poverty in the land, but yes, there is the hope of its eradication. There is judgment in the land and despair in the land, but yet there is hope for renewal. There's grief yet for the hope that weeping may endure for a night, but joy still comes in the morning. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the day when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet. The hope that James Weldon Johnson wrote in a poem in 1900 reminds us that there is a kind of hope that has had the capacity to span centuries of human disappointment and delays. Yet with a steady beat, our feet have navigated the tension between possible and impossible daily. A tension between what is and what we want it to be. A tension between what we got and what we need. Every human heart cries and yearns for the same thing, a chance to fulfill his or her dreams. All of us possess the same desire to be free to pursue the vision and dreams of our heart. Freedom. The French Revolution was fought because of it, and now France fights again for the freedom of self-expression. Freedom. The colonists fought to get it from Britain, and Gandhi sat down for it. Freedom, 
It is what our ancestors stayed up all night long watching and waiting for freedom at the dawn with the rising of the sun. Freedom. Our foremothers and fathers died believing it would come one day. So they sang, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Freedom. It is what our parents marched for and sang. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. Freedom. It is what we sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, walking the line between Montgomery and Selma, our arms linked as we sat down at lunch counters and walked the streets and bus rides sight. And we sang, we shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Freedom. We want it, but we still don't understand it. Freedom. Is it being free from laws and accountability? Freedom. Is it as long as I don't hurt anybody? Freedom. It is enslaving others to secure my own power. Freedom. Is it creating circumstances and legislating limitations to those who look and sound and act differently? Freedom. Is it to take somebody else's social security number, credit cards, bank account, just for your own financial gain? Freedom. We know, said Dr. King, through painful experience, that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. But freedom costs. Freedom is expensive. It costs Dred Scott. It costs Denmark Vesey. It caught Nat Turner. It caught Sinke. It costs Lincoln his life. It costs Martin King Jr. his life. Coretta, her husband, the children, a daddy, and it costs God the life of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, you can live without a lot of things in this volatile, uncertain world of ours. But you cannot live without courage. And if there's anything that we learn from Dr. King's life, it is courage. For courage is essential, it is necessary, it is undeniable, it is also underrated. It takes courage to get out of the bed and face a day you've never seen before, not knowing how it's going to end. It takes courage to kiss your children goodbye in the morning and be unsure they're gonna come home at the end of the day. It takes courage to hug those you love and pray all day on them. It takes courage for you to think for yourself in a world that tries to mold and shape your opinions. It takes courage to stand up in a crowd when doing so put a target on your back. It takes courage to speak up when your job and title and position will benefit from your silence. It takes courage to strive towards excellence when the world has all agreed on a program of mediocrity. Did I say it takes courage to live? Did I say that? It takes courage to stare down hell when you're afraid of hell, confronted by hell, when you're outnumbered in hell, then tell hell to go to hell. It takes courage. Courage is the difference between whether you give up and whine or show up and shine. Dr. King once said, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite the obstacles. Cowardness is submissive, surrender to your circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowards ask the question, is it safe? 
Expediency, ask the question, is it politic? Vanity, ask the question, is it popular? But conscious, ask the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one that you take because it is right. Today, my brothers and sisters, you will find that you will need to find some courage. You will need to find the courage of your convictions to face the nuances of this day and time. Courage to refuse to normalize negative entrenched practices and speak the truth in the face of bold-faced lies. Because there are those who believe that if they keep telling the lie long enough, it will become truth. As Dr. King said yesterday, which is so true today, we must build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. Courage, what does it look like? It looks like Kobe Barron, a 15-year-old freshman at a suburban high school in Houston, Texas. And when he read in his geography textbooks that the Africans who were brought here were actually immigrants, to plantations in the 15 and 1800s were workers rather than slaves. That his ancestors were immigrants and not enslaved. Courage, he told his mother. And his mother, Ronnie Dean Barron said, this is what erasure looks like. And shame the textbook company to put slavery back into American history books. If I was in church, I'd tell you, touch your neighbor and say, courage. <laughs> courage is taking the step anyway, doing the job anyway, facing the opposition anyway, making the phone call anyway, putting your name on the ballot anyway, making the decision anyway, going back to school anyway, starting your business anyway. Raising your grandchildren, your sister's children, everybody else's children, anyway. <laughs> Courage is doing what you think you cannot do and what everyone else says is impossible to do. I tell you, Courage, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Courage, black women, professional mathematics, human computers, who worked for NASA in the segregated west section of Langley Research Lab in Hampton, Virginia. These three women did what others said was impossible to do. They calculated flight trajectories for Project Murphy, uh, Mercury in 1962, pre-IBM days, to get astronaut John Glenn into space. Dorothy taught herself computer code and then turned around and taught her girls back in the segregated West area, basically handling a finicky new IBM computer and then becoming the first black supervisor at NASA. Now, if you saw the movie, you have your own favorite parts. But my favorite part was when John Glenn says, uh, if Catherine says the figures are right, we go into space. That's my favorite part. If girl don't validate it, we ain't going in the story. Courage, in spite of every obstacle, is taking your work two miles away to the bathroom as Catherine did at NASA because there were no colored restrooms where she was working. It is sitting in class with all men in front of an instructor says that we have not reworked this curriculum for a woman. It is going to court to get into an all-white high school to take the classes necessary to become an engineer. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Courage. It is working late beyond working late to calculate and fact check and recheck the work of other people. Am I talking about courage here? Courage is taking down the colored-only bathroom sign and throwing it away. Amen. Uh, 
That's courage. Courage. It is putting your socks on when you have no shoes. It is setting the table when you have no food. It is planning a budget when your money is low. It is looking at houses to buy when you're still living in your mama's house. It is sowing your own wings and learning to fly where imagination has no boundaries, where no goal is unreachable. If King taught us anything, he taught us to have courage. Uh, let's just make pretend we're at church so I can say, slap your neighbor and say, courage. Courage is the handmaiden of living. It is hard to have one without another. But there is another kind of courage that reaches beyond the present moment to have impact on generations to come. It is called an uncommon courage. It is this kind of courage that calls us to speak when everyone else is silent, to act while everyone is still in shock, to move forward when a retreat has been announced. It is the kind of courage that reaches beyond self to impact the lives of others for generation to come. What we need now is more people of uncommon courage. Turn to the neighbor, I told you we're in church now. Turn to the neighbor on the right and left and say, is it you? Is it you? Are you the one? We need people of uncommon courage because people of uncommon courage won't just complain about the problem, but will collaborate to solve them. We must work together for a solution to problems that are face us. And we can't afford to start working on each other because that's what they really want us to do. They want us to get us to turn on each other. Black against white, against Native Americans, rich against poor, Hispanic against European, men against women. Now, as long as we are nipping at each other's heels, we will miss what is important and significant. We must find the uncommon courage to work together. Turn back to your neighbor and say, now. Find a way to speak with one voice. Uh, see if we can identify the common ground we can stand on. Uh, settle the issue of who takes credit. There's enough sunshine for everybody to have their day. People of uncommon courage will not just criticize the system, but will work to change the system. Not for yourselves, but for those who are yet unborn. Know your history. Get your facts straight before you go knocking down on doors of oppression or scale the frightening heights of injustice. People of uncommon courage will not waste time playing the blame game. That is blaming others. It's your fault you're sick. It's your fault you have a pre-existing condition. It is your fault you can't find a job. It is your fault you can't get an education. It is your fault you can't start a business. It is your fault that you have to sleep in your car every night. It is your fault you can't go to college. It's your fault for the predicaments we find ourselves. But we will keep moving forward. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop it. How can you say, as Dr. King said, to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his bootstrap. Stop playing the blame game. So here is encouragement today and everyone who thinks all hope is lost and to all who have faced obstacles when everything says it's all gone. Beloved, God is still able to do more and abundantly that which we ask. I don't care, God is still in charge. You didn't vote him in, and you can't vote him out. Beloved, the fierce urgency of now that Dr. King preached about must now become the fierce urgency of right now. 
We need a power not of our own to propel this new right now movement forward. That means voter right protection right now. Jobs right now. The end of poverty right now. The end of senseless violence right now. Fair sentencing right now. Well, stand down, stand your ground right now. Right now to transform the jangling discords of fear and prejudice as King said, into a symphony of brotherhood that can become a source of healing in the unresolved United States of Affairs. Uh, right now, uh, to help us to lift our voices, to sing in one united chorus, uh, a song that brings dignity to the abused, strength to the weak, hope for the helpless, answers to perplexing problems, because one morning uh, we'll wake up and what is in the past is staring us in the face. Now in the great tradition of preachers, as I take my seat, <laughs> let us become a people of uncommon courage. King says our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Since my life matters, since my life matters, since, 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 since my life matters, and, and since your life matters, uh -huh, and since black lives matters, uh -huh, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. For me to say black lives matter doesn't negate your life mattering. It means I accept my own personhood as valuable. I do not have to devour, devalue anyone in order to celebrate my own value. So, since black lives matter, and they do value matter, we will pray for and respect women as those who bear and nurture life as a commitment to black lives matter. Since Black Lives Matter, and it does matter, we will stop domestic violence against the people we live with in our homes, especially women, children, and an age. Since Black Lives Matter, come on baby, I'm rolling now. Since Black Lives Matter, we'll get tested for HIV and be ethical in our conduct once we receive the results. You need to turn the mic up, sweetheart. Since Black Lives Matter, uh, we will advocate for the poor and the oppressed, uh, not just in North America, but wherever oppression is found. Uh, since uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, we will respect officers of the law who are sworn to protect and serve and expect the same respect in return. Since Black Lives Matter, we will pledge the vote in every election uh, not just once every four years. Since Black Lives Matter, we will help family and friends find the mental health support they need without stigmatization. Uh, since uh, Black Lives Matter, we will stop abusing drugs, uh, alcohol, and tobacco and work with groups uh, to stop the drug dealers in your neighborhood, in my neighborhood, in everybody's neighborhood. Since Black Lives Matter, we will support and adopt black children our sense of Black Lives Matter. We will eat better. We will sleep better. We will exercise more. Since uh, Black Lives Matter, we will work uh, in our community to eradicate gang violence right now. Since uh, Black Lives Matter, we will oppose human trafficking. Since uh, Black Lives Matter, we will support young people to pursue their education, their trade, and their skill. Since Black Lives Matter, we will be concerned about mass incorporation and help former inmates get their voting rights restored. Since Black Lives Matter, we will be civil with those who do not agree with us anyway. Since uh, 
Black Lives Matter. We will work for job creation and, and protect uh, the environment at the same time. Since I matter, you matter, all God's children matter, we will get it done in our generation. All, tell me preacher woman did not just drop the mic. You did not just do that. Now, I have a question for our signer. Baby, did you get all that? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Good job. Oh. Correct me if I'm wrong, ladies and gentlemen, but I think we done got took to church. Whether you wanted to go or not, you got took there. Um, I have no words. I, and, and anybody who knows me knows that that is not a regular state of affairs. Right, Joyce? I have no words. I really don't. Um, at that. <laughs> wow. So I'm supposed to do a little commercial here for the bishop. She's written like 12,000 books. And one of the latest, which will be on, is it on sale now, Bishop, or is it going to be? OK, of course you can. Um, it's going to be on sale May 23rd, but you can order your copy today. I love this title. The Big Deal of Taking Small Steps to Move Closer to God. I'm sorry, I don't think you heard me. The big deal of taking small steps to move closer to God by Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie. So you can order your copy today on Amazon.com, I'm assuming. And then I'm sure you've got your own thing going on because that's the way you roll, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that, was, that uplifted me. And I, I think a lot of us, for our own personal reasons, um, needed some uplifting today. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, while I'm doing a little housekeeping chore here, I've been told that there is a reception in the cafeteria. OK, there is a reception in the cafeteria at the end of our program. I just want to thank you all so much for being here to celebrate the greatness that is and always will be Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a man who transformed the way people look at us, but more importantly, transform the way we look at ourselves. I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of this program. Uh, Columbus is my home. I've lived here every single day of my life. I'm very proud to say that, and I'm very proud of the way the city of Columbus celebrates the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This city is always striving to uphold the ideals of fairness and equality that Dr. King wanted for all Americans, regardless of skin color, ethnicity, or religious beliefs, and to uphold those ideals with love. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love 
can do that. As we hear once again from the Pentecost Arise Choir, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and neighbors, let's go forth with love.
My dear friends, this has been a fantastic evening of reflection, of inspiration, and thanks to Bishop Vashti, a call to action, a call to courage, and a call to make a difference. And I'm so grateful that I have been asked to be part of this wonderful celebration this evening, and I'm so honored to be among so many wonderful people from our community. And I know that we have a variety of faith traditions in the room tonight, but we call, we understand that we have one Heavenly Father. And so together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. May we take action by the grace you have given us in our lives, that we may turn our faith into hope and our hope into love. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good night. Amen.